Hi, my name is Gabriella Resto. I'm a P3 PharmD MPH student. Hi, my name is Lena Thomas. I am currently a P1 pharmacy student. Hi, my name is Lauren Ampadu, and I'll be a P1 pharmacy student in fall of 2022. We're all representatives of the Yukon School of Pharmacy Diversity Committee, and we are here today to discuss our presentation titled Exploring the Impact of Social Determinants of Health and Health Outcomes. Here you'll see we have our table of contents. To begin our presentation, we'll introduce you to the social determinants of health, followed by a description of health literacy, food insecurity, the impact of zip code on health outcomes, health disparities in Connecticut, minority health, and COVID-19 and the social determinants of health. So first off, we'll start off by explaining what are the social determinants of health? Social determinants of health are conditions in which people live, grow, work, and age. These conditions are health indicators that greatly impact a person's life and are comprised of economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, food, community and social context, and healthcare systems. As you can see in the diagram, all these factors lead to our health outcomes, our health status, our limitations, our life expectancy, and more. Due to the way our society is structured, communities of color are more likely to experience inequities. Here are some key definitions that'll be useful to familiarize yourself with. Personal health literacy is the degree to which individuals have the ability to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. Organizational health literacy is the degree to which organizations equitably enable individuals to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. Health equity is the attainment of the highest level for health for all people. And health disparities are particular types of health differences that are closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. One big factor that affects people's health revolves around health literacy and education. If people are more aware of their own health status and the information surrounding it, people are able to make more informed decisions. Limited education is something that can reduce health literacy and lead to poor healthy behaviors. So it's important to recognize that not everyone may have the same knowledge as everyone else and be mindful of that. For example, if someone is aware of how their medication works in their body and what the medication is for, then they are more likely to take that medication consistently. We can combat this and help others gain health literacy as health professionals by asking patients open-ended questions, using simple language, speaking slowly, and more. However, there are other deficits in our system aside from low health literacy. Here, we will explore food insecurity and how it's relevant in Connecticut. People who don't have access to grocery stores that offer healthy foods at affordable prices are less likely to have good nutrition. This raises their risk of developing health conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, and obesity, and it even lowers their life expectancy. It's important to recognize that these disparities exist and with respect to food and nutrition and its effect on people. Simply promoting healthy choices won't eliminate these and other health disparities. So instead, Public health organizations and their partners in sectors like education, transportation, and housing need to take action to improve the availability and accessibility of proper food choices in people's environments. Looking at this slide, we have a definition of the food desert. The food desert is a residential area with limited access to affordable and nutritious food. Food deserts have been identified as one driver of the obesity epidemic, and living in a food desert has been linked to a poor diet and greater risk of obesity. Food swamps are neighborhoods where fast food and junk food outweigh the healthy alternatives. Studies show that the food swamp is largely associated with race and also with income. 
Low income and racial or ethnic minorities are more likely than whites to live near unhealthy food retailers, which has been associated with poor diet, as 10 out of 12 studies provide evidence that fast food restaurants are more likely to locate in areas where there are higher concentrations of ethnic minorities than whites. These associations raise questions about casualty and suggest that the race and ethnicity of a community shapes the actions of the food industry and community design decision makers, which in turn influence the food environment present in that society. So why does this matter? The food that is sold in grocery stores directly impacts how much nutritious food people eat, and it also impacts disease prevalence among the population. These disparities have a correlation with race. For every additional supermarket in a census tract, produce consumption increases 32% for African Americans and 11% for whites, according to the multi-state study. Now, here's some statistics specific to the state of Connecticut. In Connecticut, 428,800 people are facing hunger, and of them, 109,480 are children. One in eight people face hunger, and one in seven children face hunger. And in Connecticut, people facing hunger are estimated to report needing $248,587,000 more per year just to meet their food needs. Additionally, the average cost of one meal in Connecticut is $3.39, according to Feeding America. Moreover, Charitable programs aren't able to fully support those who are facing hunger. And so the combination of both charity and government assistance programs are necessary to help bridge the meal gap. SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, provides temporary help for people going through hard times, providing supplements of money to buy food until they can get back on their feet. And so in Connecticut, 31.4% of households receiving SNAP benefits have children. Also, the $584,718,600 that's distributed through SNAP has generated $994,021,620 in economic activity. Every dollar a household redeems through SNAP generates about $1.70 in economic activity. Here, we'll look at the impact of zip code on health outcomes. So firstly, zip code can negatively impact food and diet. As we just mentioned before, the food that we eat directly affects how healthy we are. Unfortunately, though, zip code can leave many with no real say in what foods they can actually purchase and or receive. Highly processed foods that lack nutritional value have been associated with higher risk of heart disease, diabetes, and obesity, as well as shortened life expectancy, according to Healthy, Healthy People 2030. In regards to access to hospitals and primary health care providers, sometimes people don't receive recommended health care services such as cancer screenings or routine visits to the eye doctor because they don't have a primary care provider. Other times, it's because they live too far away from health care providers who offer their desired services. Moreover, cost is a barrier that prevents people from getting treatments they need because they cannot afford them. About one in 10 people in the United States don't have health insurance. People without health insurance are less likely to have a primary care provider, and they may not be able to afford the health care services and medications that they need. There are, however, some initiatives to mitigate these impacts. For example, strategies to increase insurance coverage rates are critical for making sure that more people get important health care services like preventative care, and treatment for chronic illnesses, interventions to increase access to healthcare professionals, and to improve communication, both in person and remotely, can help more people to get the care they really need. Next, here's how exposure to pollutants and health hazards impacts health outcomes. Many people in the United States live in neighborhoods without safe drinking water or where the water they do have doesn't have the recommended amount of fluoride. Toxic pollutants in the air make the air unsuitable to breathe. 
housing costs exceed more than 30% of their income, and there are motor vehicle crashes. Hearing loss can occur due to noise exposure at work, and indoor smoking loss can negatively affect people's lungs. Racial and ethnic minorities and people with low incomes are more likely to live in places with these hazards. In addition, some people are exposed to secondhand smoke or loud noise at work, like we had just mentioned. Some communities don't have sidewalks on which people can safely travel to work or school or simply to get fresh air, and so motor vehicle crashes are a problem in those areas. So in order to address this issue, interventions and policy changes at the local, state, and federal level can help reduce these health and safety risks and can help promote health. For example, providing opportunities for people to walk and bike in their communities, like adding sidewalks and bike lanes. These changes can increase safety and help improve the overall quality of life in these zip code areas. Next, we have access to quality education. People with high levels of education are more likely to be healthier and live longer. However, children from low-income families, children with disabilities, and children who routinely experience forms of social discrimination are more likely to struggle with math and reading. They're also less likely to graduate from high school or go to college. This means that they're less likely to get safe, high-paying jobs and more likely to have health problems like heart disease, diabetes, and depression. Additionally, some children live in places with poorly performing schools, and many families can't even afford to send their children to college. The stress of living in poverty can also affect children's brain development, making it hard for them to do well in school. One initiative that's been proven to improve the quality of education is full-day kindergarten. Full-day kindergarten has been recommended by the Community Preventive Services Task Force as these programs substantially improve reading and math skills. This allows kids to have long-term academic and health-related positive outcomes in comparison to half-day kindergarten or full-day kindergarten on alternating days or twice a week. Of course, this intervention can't be implemented if it's not accessible to the affected populations of students. The website Healthcare Access and Quality has some important links to current initiatives in the United States of America that are currently working to address and ameliorate these disparities. And if you look over to the right of the slide, you'll see different hospitals in the state of Connecticut. And if you look in the corners of Connecticut and the far extremities, there aren't as many hospitals as there are in the center. And so many of these states are left without coverage. So now let's talk about some specific health disparities in our state that are a result of many of these previously mentioned social determinants. One of these disparities that we see in this slide is health, uh, health life expectancy, which is a result of some factors such as food insecurity, healthcare accessibility, zip code, pollution, and education. All key social determinants that Alina, Alina and Lauren previously touched upon. For example, on the left hand side, we see four different areas or general locations. The first one being Seymour Street in Hartford, which is the address of Hartford Hospital, Farmington Avenue in Farmington, Connecticut, which is near the Yukon Health Campus in Farmington. Then we see the general Hartford County and the state of Connecticut. We also see life expectancy based on racial and ethnic identity. And when we look at life expectancy across the board, we see that there's a general 10 year gap in life expectancy based on specific location. This gap is most evident when we consider the Hartford location near Hartford Hospital and the Farmington location near Yukon Health. Although these two addresses are only 15 minutes away from each other, there's a nearly 10 year difference in life expectancy. And these life expectancies also correlate with the proportions of racial and ethnic groups in these communities. For example, in the Farmington area, 
we see that there is almost the highest percentage of white individuals living in this community at 78.8%. This community has the highest life expectancy, and this is similar with Connecticut overall, which has a 79.7% um, white population, and the life expectancy is still pretty high at 80.4 years. In contrast, we see that Hartford, um, specifically the area near Hartford Hospital, has the lowest proportion of white individuals at 29.6%, but it has the highest rate of Hispanics and Latinos, as well as Black and African American individuals at 44.7% for the Hispanic and Latino community and 37.2% for the Black and African American community. And this community has the lowest life expectancy at 71.9 years. So overall, we see that communities that have the highest proportion of white individuals demonstrate longer life expectancies. So let's take it a step farther and discuss additional disparities that are evident across these communities. One additional disparity that we can focus on that's particularly prevalent in the Black community is infant mortality. And for this, we're going to be focusing on infant mortality in Connecticut. We see here in the graph that the infant mortality rate in Connecticut in 2019 was 4.4 deaths per 1,000 births. And this is lower than the national average, which is 5.6 deaths per 1,000 births. However, this is still significantly lower than the average for Hispanic and Latino, as well as Black communities. The white community in Connecticut has the lowest average of infant mortality, which is 3.9 deaths per 1,000 births, which is lower than both the Connecticut and the national average. However, we see that the rate of infant mortality for white individuals is less than half of that as the infant mortality rate for Black individuals, which is 8.5 deaths per 1,000 births. It's also really important to note that the average infant mortality among the Black and African American community in Connecticut is still greater than the 5.6 death average for the whole country. Some additional disparities that we can talk about in Connecticut that are evident within these communities are low birth weight, asthma, and diabetes. Similar to infant mortality, we see very similar trends in maternal and infant health outcomes with regards to low birth weight in the Black community. For example, babies born to Black mothers are twice as likely to have low birth weight compared to their white counterparts. And low birth weight babies actually have a greater risk of um, negative health outcomes, such as cognitive impairment, developmental delays, and chronic disease later in life. And some, of, some examples of these are cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. When we talk about asthma, we see similar trends as well. For example, Black adolescents are 4.5 times as likely to be hospitalized than white adolescents. And similarly, Hispanic and Latino adolescents are greater than three times as likely to be hospitalized compared to white adolescents. And if we connect this back to the life expectancy chart that we saw in the previous slide, um, and some of the key points that were brought up early in this presentation, we now know that Black and Hispanic communities are predominantly centered in urban areas in the state, such as Hartford, which we saw in the chart but other, other cities as well, such as Willimantic, New Haven, and Bridgeport. A lot of these urban areas also have higher rates of pollution, which contributes to the greater rates of asthma in these marginalized communities. Furthermore, Black and Hispanic individuals are more than twice as likely to have diabetes complications compared to white individuals, and Black individuals are more than twice as likely to die from diabetes complications compared to white individuals. So now let's discuss these 
particular individual communities and focus more on minority health. When we're talking about major barriers to healthcare access, there are many factors that influence a person's ability to access healthcare. And when we're talking about the Black and Latinx communities in particular, some of these barriers include discrimination, distrust in the healthcare system, lack of culturally competent providers, lack of insurance, insurance coverage, healthcare costs, no usual source of care, low health literacy, and language barriers. And when we're talking about all of these barriers that are very unique to a lot of these Black and Latinx populations, a lot of these barriers often end up um, as major health disparities, which we've seen in previous slides. And some of these health disparities and chronic health outcomes include diabetes, asthma, and as we also pre previously discussed, low birth weight and infant mortality, but other chronic conditions that are very prevalent within these communities include hypertension, obesity, cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer, and psychological, psychological distress. Some of these barriers that we've seen, such as discrimination, distrust in the healthcare system, and lack of culturally competent providers are examples of system level, level issues. And while it's important, to, um, it's important to increase culturally competent providers within the healthcare system and bilingual or multilingual providers. There's also a disparity in representation within the healthcare system. For example, if we're talking about minority physicians, as of 2018, only 5% of physicians in the US identified as Black or African American, and 5.8% of physicians in the US identified as Hispanic. When we're talking about pharmacists, an area of interest for all of us. As of 2019, only 4.9% of pharmacists in the U.S. identified as Black or African American, and only 4.5% of pharmacists in the U.S. identified as Hispanic. So why is this important that we not only have culturally competent providers, bilingual providers, but also representation within the healthcare system? It's important to increase minority representation because it boosts patient satisfaction and satisfaction of care because minority providers understand and relate to the cultural nuances of these patient populations. This has been shown to improve health outcomes. And for example, when we're talking about the Hispanic community, Hispanic pharmacists that serve predominantly Hispanic communities not only mitigate language barriers, but having these individuals serve the communities that they represent has also been shown to increase medication adherence. Another really important community that we can talk about with regards to minority health are immigrants or un the undocumented community. This community also experiences major unique barriers to healthcare access, such as fear of deportation, discrimination, stigma associated with undocumented status, lack of capital, which can include lack of trans translational services, cultural competency, and funding barred access to health insurance because undocumented individuals are not able to access federal health insurance, limited healthcare capacity, language barriers, personal finances, and low health literacy. And again, these all translate to major health disparities that are unique for these communities. Some are similar to the Black and Latinx populations that we discussed in the previous slide, but we also see a lot of unique conditions as well, such as kidney disease, liver disease, functional impairment and disability, metabolic syndrome, and psychological distress. However, it's super important to note that these disparities are not generalizable across all immigrants or all undocumented individuals. Health outcomes vary greatly based on nativity, race, and ethnicity. For example, although we tend to see that immigrants may have increased rates of diabetes, this is particularly true of Asian immigrants um, because we see higher rates of diabetes in foreign-born Asian individuals, whereas foreign birth is actually a protective factor for some other communities.
And the last community that we'll be talking about with regards to minority health is the LGBTQIA plus community. The barriers that are unique to this community include provider mistreatment and negative interactions, financial burdens, stigma associated with queer identity, high medical costs, inadequate health care insurance, violence, family ostracism, and lack of social support. And these last three often intertwine with each other. And so we see that a lot of these barriers translate into the outcomes that we can see in the infograph on the right hand side. And for example, we see that LGBT young people aged 16 to 27 are five times more likely to attempt suicide because of many of the barriers and a lot of the stigma that they face in society. Furthermore, 33% have self harm and Transgender people aged 18 are 11 times more likely to commit self-harm. Some additional statistics associated with this marginalized community. 47% of transgender individuals say they experience some form of negative and or discriminatory Discrim discriminatory treatment from a doctor or healthcare provider. This is really important to note because our role as healthcare students or providers is to be aware of these disparities and these cultural complexities with the populations that we will be treating. The more information we can gather now about these communities, the better we'll be able to serve them when we practice down the line. Furthermore, only 67% of hospitals that publish or provide an anti-discrimination policy were found to have a patient non-discrimination -discrim policy that includes both sexual orientation and gender identity. This makes a huge difference for the patients that we serve because just changing that minor wording in anti-discrimination policy can influence so many patients within those 67% of hospitals. Additionally, 73% of transgender Americans say they believe that they would be refused medical services because of their LGBTQ status. It's important for us to debunk a lot of these myths about healthcare and be able to mitigate these barriers so that we can increase access to healthcare for many of these individuals that identify within this community. Now we will transition to discussing COVID-19, a disease that has affected not only Connecticut, but the entire world. This disease has disproportionately affected minorities in underserved communities and continues to do so, as you will further see. We will be using this as a case study to discuss the social determinants of health and what poor social determinants can look like. But for now, what is COVID-19? COVID-19, or Coronavirus Disease 2019, is a pandemic revolving around a severe respiratory illness. Over 900,000 people have died in the United States, and there have been over 79 million cases alone in the United States. Millions of people have died from this disease worldwide. COVID-19 greatly altered how we operate socially and in our communities. Due to the status of the pandemic, people are practicing social isolation and social distancing. This isolation from others sometimes made communities come together, but more often than not, communities were broken and relationships were fractured due to the pandemic. The prevalence of anti-Asian, Asian-American hate crimes spiked due to COVID-19. Since COVID-19 originated in China, people of East and Southeast Asian descent in the United States have faced waves of racism and hate crimes, blaming them for the virus's existence. This further divided communities. Things were already difficult since everyone was conscious of COVID-19. People were less willing to interact with others, and this often negatively impacted mental health since people could not rely on their usual routines or activities for comfort. Local shops were closed, some of them for good, which affected the livelihood of many people. Other, more public places that people relied on, libraries, churches, schools, were all closed as well. However, for the communities that were able to support one another and rally together, they have been able to increase both healthcare quality and healthcare accessibility in the common person. As stated, the healthcare quality during COVID-19 varied greatly. Depending on the community you resided in, access to COVID-19 testing and vaccines differed. Many communities experienced a duality. Younger people who are more experienced with 
with technology were able to go to websites and navigate them with ease in order to get their vaccines. Older people, or people without internet access, or people with lowered health literacy were not able to do so, and would often have to seek help from other resources. Another factor relating to healthcare quality is that of the higher workloads. Since COVID cases were pouring into hospitals and health systems, a lot of workers were experiencing symptoms of burnout. Healthcare workers constantly have been putting themselves on the front lines for the sake of patient help, but at the cost of their mental and physical health. Healthcare quality was also affected by the disconnect between administration and healthcare systems and the frontline workers. Some administrative leaders just simply did not understand and would encourage frontline workers to push harder when they were already operating on fumes. We are now switching gears to look at everyone, not just healthcare workers. With jobs being closed and schools being shut down, there were a lot more people in households and a lot less income occurring. As shown by the graph on the left side, over one in four adults had trouble paying for their usual household expenses in the last seven days, and that was as of October 2021. Frontline workers are at greater risk of contracting COVID-19, and contracting COVID-19 not only led to incredibly debilitating experiences physically, but also financially. This, along with the fact that people were losing their jobs and that their health care benefits due to company cuts and shutdowns, leads to an incredibly difficult situation, especially for bigger families and those who are in marginalized communities. With financial burden also comes limited access to food and housing. The job losses just mentioned often came unevenly, with more severe cuts being made in low paying industries and non essential work. However, these industries that people speak of, chefs, restaurant workers, cleaners, and housekeepers, attendants, so forth. These people are often people of color who may not be able to work other jobs or easily find something new. This shows how heavily some communities can be. These effects compound onto one another and leave people unable to bounce back from these situations. Some statistics from the Census Bureau Household Pulse Survey. Almost 20 million adults stated that they were not getting adequate meals and approximately 12 million adults were behind in rent. Now, in the United States, families are able to receive monetary relief for certain needs, such as rent, mortgages, meals, bills, loans, and more. While this relief helps some, the difficulties that communities face are still persisting as of fall 2021. As you can see in the graph on the right, while there's been gradual decrease of difficulty heading into 2021, you can see the graph starting to pick up and increase around May, and continuing to stay steady as time continues to pass. As of the time of this recording, guidelines for the COVID-19 pandemic have relaxed greatly, and people are excited at the potential of normalcy. However, for a sizable amount of Americans, normalcy isn't something that can be so easily returned to. With the economic instability, the change in our education system with schools going online, the lack of food, and the shifts in community and healthcare, the disparities are incredibly vast and shows how much more work needs to be done in our local areas in order to provide health equity for all. And to wrap up this presentation, we're going to touch upon some concluding thoughts and key points. Social determinants of health, such as education, food insecurity, and geographic location are all leading drivers to health disparities. And communities of color experience worse health, worse health outcomes due to systemic racism and poor social determinants. COVID-19 disproportionately impacts communities of color and exacerbates disparities in health access and outcomes. Marginalized communities experience very varying health outcomes based on unique social and systemic barriers to healthcare access. Overall, it's important for healthcare professionals such as ourselves to understand the cultural complexities of these communities that we serve in order to ultimately mitigate barriers and improve patient outcomes. Thank you so much for your time in viewing our presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the School of Pharmacy Diversity Committee. Thank you so much.